Sequels are really tough. Getting a series off the ground is hard, sure, but once you've got momentum and hype behind a brand, your problems change. Suddenly you have millions of eyes watching your next move, seeing how you'll attempt to follow up your initial success. Do you give the fans exactly what they want, or do you try to subvert those expectations? Do you make it a direct sequel, or a completely unrelated story? In video games, there are some legendary sequels, games that surpass their originals and bring the series into new heights. Then there's the others. The forgettable, the repetitive, and the straight up terrible. Sometimes it's due to publisher meddling, development issues, or just a few bad decisions. But sequels like these can kill a franchise. In the history of video games, there's one sequel that has always baffled me. Almost exclusively it's mentioned with derision, and rarely does anyone have something good to say about it, despite its decent critical response. Today, we're talking about Amnesia A Machine for Pigs, its polarizing reception, and why I believe it deserved better. The Amnesia series is a truly bizarre one. The first game was developed during a time of financial turmoil for frictional games, and wasn't expected to become the hit that it was. Amnesia The Dark Descent is easily one of the most important horror games of the 2010s. It influenced indie games in a way that not many others have, and it made back its budget tenfold in the first two years of its release. It came out at the perfect time. A lot of its early popularity came from the burgeoning Let's Play community on YouTube, and it very quickly became the most popular popular game to record yourself screaming to. Small and large studios alike would do anything for the kind of reception and success Amnesia received. So, Frictional had options. Their next game, Soma, had already been formulating in the team's brains, and while they wanted to do more with the Amnesia universe, they couldn't split their attention between two projects. What they did instead was… well, a little weird. The team decided that they would hand the Amnesia license to another studio, a studio that was already making a name for themselves. That team was the Chinese Room, and they would be the ones to develop a machine for pigs. This decision wasn't entirely responsible for the game's poor reception, but it was absolutely a sign of things to come. If the first game had benefited from the time in which it was released, the sequel was the exact opposite. The Dark Descent thrived on the fact that it came out of nowhere. It was an indie darling that arrived with little to no build-up, whereas now, everyone knew the name Amnesia, and more importantly, they knew what to expect. An Amnesia sequel, especially one announced so soon after the original's release, had a lot to live up to. but. The Chinese room weren't frictional. They didn't make games the same way. They originally began making Half-Life 2 mods, and their breakout hit, Dear Esther, was a slow burn exploration game. Their games were all about narrative and minimalist gameplay, a far cry from Frictional's monster-heavy Amnesia. That doesn't mean it was a complete mismatch. Dear Esther definitely had horror elements, and Amnesia used similar methods of telling its story through flashbacks and narration. With this in mind, let's have a look at the development for A Machine for Pigs. The story begins in 2010. Developers Thomas Grip and Jens Nilsson had already decided that they could hand the Amnesia license to another developer. It was just a case of finding the right team. A year later, at GDC Europe, the two met Dan Pinchbeck, and over the course of a few months, ideas were passed back and forth between Frictional and the Chinese Room before development officially began in December 2011. By all accounts, A Machine for Pigs had a much different development than its predecessor. Frictional had everything to lose financially with the Dark Descent whereas the Chinese room came in with the groundwork already done. The general ambience and style of Amnesia was set in stone. The story had to be mysterious. The protagonist had to be powerless in the face of inhuman abominations, but the sequel didn't have to be tied down to any particular timeline. From what I can gather, the development was quite collaborative. The narrative was constructed by Dan, the music by the extremely talented Jessica Curry, and Frictional allowed them to use Amnesia's HBL engine too. Frictional didn't just hand over their biggest franchise and Prey, they maintained constant communication throughout development. When reading interviews with Dan and Jessica, the biggest worry regarding a sequel to The Dark Descent seemed to be how many players never made it to the end. Horror games, especially ones that set out to be as terrifying as Amnesia, run into the issue of alienating huge audiences. Not everyone enjoys being scared, and for a lot of people, Amnesia was the game they saw people scream and throw their headphones off to. These people won't, or in some cases simply can't, play or 
finish games like Amnesia. There's an argument to be had about whether it's on the audience to confront these fears for the sake of a good story, or if the developer has to decide to just ignore a large portion of the gaming public and not dumb down their scares. For the Chinese room, who are out to make a complex story, it wasn't as simple as making the game less scary. Throughout development, there were multiple major changes. The game was originally meant to have a similar mechanic to the sanity meter in the original, this time based on infection, and the player would have to collect medicine to combat it. Ultimately, the mechanic was cut for two main reasons. The first was that Dan felt it was too open to exploitation. The player would find a way to trivialize it, as many had done in The Dark Descent. The second was because he felt the player would be too focused on inventory and collecting items that it would shatter their immersion and take them out of the story. These design decisions weren't made lightly, and lengthy back and forth conversations with Frictional were had during development. All of this isn't to say that the development went smoothly. It was actually quite the opposite. It was originally intended to be released in 2012, only a year after development officially began, and for a team as small as the Chinese Room, it wasn't feasible. The studio only became official after Dear Esther's unprecedented success, and they had already begun working on a prototype for Everybody's Gone to the Rapture when they accepted the deal with Frictional. The result was a messy year of working across two very different projects, and A Machine for Pigs ended up being delayed twice, first to summer 2013, and finally to September. This is where the game's image problem begins to form. Upon release, it actually reviewed quite well. Not as amazing as The Dark Descent, mind you, but it had very respectable scores from critics. The one seemingly ubiquitous criticism was that the game was far too easy. There were fewer monsters, even fewer chase segments, no sanity or oil management, and a lot more walking around empty halls. While some critics hated it, and others loved it, most thought it was a 7 out of 10. Player reviews were a whole different story. The game was lambasted in public spaces as being nothing compared to The Dark Descent. It was too easy, not as scary, and one of the most disappointing sequels of all time. And this is an image that the game has failed to shake almost a decade later. The problem is, when you release a game called Amnesia, people expect, well, Amnesia. While the games played and looked the same, they were actually quite different. The gaming public wanted more amnesia. They wanted more jump scares, sneaking, managing resources, but what they got was something else entirely. This dawning epoch, this age of reason, an empire grown fat, ripe for the bleeding. Amnesia, a machine for pigs, takes the same basic setup as the original. Our protagonist Mandis wakes up in an empty building with no recollection of how they got there. You stumble around for a while, discovering little trails of details to eventually piece together what happened. The difference between the two games is that, if you played the first one, you already kind of know what to expect. Daniel's plot twist in the original is just assumed once you start exploring Mandis's mansion, and the game doesn't spend too long before showing you just how evil he truly was. The other major difference is in the setting, which is arguably what sets the two apart the most. The first game takes place in the 1830s, and very much grounds itself in this period. Daniel stumbles through an old, decrepit castle in Prussia, with torture chambers, human experiments, and magic rituals. The first game is fantasy history, whereas the sequel jumps ahead a bit to New Year's Eve 1899. This jump to industrialization sets Mandus' journey in the halls of factories and the filthy streets of London, and allows them to touch on topics like poor houses, the abuse of the working class, and the greed of the elite. What I'm doing right here, this comparison, is exactly what people did when the game first came out, comparing and contrasting two games which really, other than the title, had very little in common. They are both games about men who induce amnesia to forget about the crimes they've committed in order to seek redemption, but that's really where the comparisons end. So for a minute, I want to talk about the game on its own merits. No comparison, just taking it as it is. Amnesia A Machine for Pigs is probably the bleakest game I've ever played. It's nasty mean, and it doesn't pull any punches. The story, which you piece together from various notes and recordings, is admittedly a little hard to follow. Oswald Mandis is a wealthy industrialist who runs a number of businesses in London, including a meat factory. However, he also seems to be a gifted mechanical engineer and inventor. The game begins with a blurry, fever-induced vision of an altar of some sort. His first 
thoughts as he wakes up are of his children, and this becomes his driving force for the rest of the game. As you stumble through the rooms of his mansion, it's quite apparent that something is wrong. Early notes have Mandus being investigated by local authorities, and angrily deciding how he could best eliminate the spies they send. His mansion contains secret passageways and one-way mirrors. The beds have cages that come down from the ceiling. It's clear there's more to this mansion than meets the eye. As you explore further, you realize you're not alone. Doors begin slamming and loud grunts and screams are heard around corners. Mandus' building hides complex machinery beneath the floorboards, conveyor belts just out of sight of regular people. He receives a phone call from another man, who doesn't give his name, but he claims that Mandus' children are trapped far below him, in the guts of a great machine. So, he continues his journey, from mansion to meat factory, through churches and graveyards, in order to repair the machine and save his children. Along the way, notes depict the true work going on in this factory. For the most part, your time with a machine for pigs is relatively lonely. The game isn't quiet by any stretch. The house groans and shakes under the power of the machine, and pipes rattle and spit steam at Mandus as he stumbles through the dark. But there's very little life here. That is, until you find the source of the grunts. The monsters roaming Mandus's factory are the man pigs, bipedal creatures that let out an ungodly squeal when alerted. As far as monster designs go, the man pigs are more conceptually creepy than they are terrifying. Their design comes from a very simple premise. Pigs are very human. The imagery of the man pigs, the meat factory, conveyor belts, from very early on it's easy to see where the story is headed, and as you read Mandus's notes describing the clinical process of combining men and pigs, the unease builds to a fever pitch. The general consensus on a machine for pigs is correct. The game isn't very scary, at least not in the sense people expect from horror games of the time. Most of the chase segments are relatively easy to navigate, and you're unlikely to die once throughout your entire four hour playthrough. In the beginning, your expectations and fear will have you creeping around hallways and poking around corners, but very quickly you recognize when these spooky noises are just noises, and not indications that an enemy is about to come barreling around the corner. Entire sections such as the part where you have to construct Compound X, were intended to have enemies constantly stalking the halls, but these were removed for one reason or another. But to say that the game isn't frightening, I would heavily contest that. If I had to use one word to describe a machine for pigs, it would be haunting. And this is thanks to three very important aspects. It's story, sound design, and music. I've already mentioned how mean the story is, and we'll get more into it in a minute, but I want to take a moment to appreciate Jessica Curry's fantastic soundtrack. Equal part orchestral choirs and screeching industrial machines, the soundtrack is one of the truly inarguable parts of this game. Every song is beautifully placed, and it's no surprise that Curry would go on to receive a BAFTA for her work on their next game, Everyone's Gone to the Rapture. Add to that the fantastic voice work of Toby Longworth and Mark Roper, giving some of the best performances I've heard in a video game, and you've got an oppressive atmosphere that seeps into each area of the factory. Here's what we learn about Oswald Mandus as he continues his journey into the heart of the machine. His wife Lily gave birth to two children, Edwin and Enoch. However, she tragically died during childbirth. Falling into despair at the loss of his wife, Mandus spent the next few years building his empire and living with his children, eventually taking them on an expedition to an Aztec temple in Mexico. Here, the twins discover an orb, and upon touching it, Mandus is flooded with visions of the upcoming century, the wars and hardships, including the deaths of his sons in the Battle of the Somme. Being forever changed by this knowledge, Mandus decides that the only way to save his children from the horrors of the 20th century is by sacrificing them on the altar. He takes their skulls back to England, where he buries them beneath a tree in his garden, and uses the orb to help power his new goal, the machine. This wasn't the only thing that changed in Mexico. Mandus returned with a sickness that apparently left him bedridden. Whether this was due to the orb's influence or some other factor is unknown, but it couldn't stop him from pursuing his new calling. The machine's purpose is simple. In order to prevent the future he has been shown, Mandus wanted to sacrifice humans on the steps of his machine, just as he did to his children in Mexico. He devises a system whereby he kidnaps people, disfigures their body, and combines them with pigs, thus creating the man-pigs that now stalk you 
throughout the halls. At some point, he splits his soul in two. One part enters the machine, giving it sentience, and the other remains in his body. However, just before the turn of the century, as the machine was reaching full power, something changed. Mandus, waking from his fever-induced haze and realizing his mistakes, sought to destroy the machine, sabotaging his work. Now, after relearning what he's forgotten, Mandus decides he's the only one who can stop the machine from claiming more lives. The metaphor is extremely clear. Mandus knows that if the world continues to go on unchecked, the conflicts of the coming century will claim millions of innocent lives, being sent like pigs to the slaughter. His notes reveal his anger at the elites and upper class who look down on the beggars and poorer members of society. So, he hosted elaborate parties to lure these people into his house, and eventually, to the machine. Despite his well-founded fears, whether corrupted by an unknown power or just a broken mind, his plan is not an altruistic one. The machine was intended to be a god, processing rich and poor alike until they would become little more than animals, sparing them from a future of pain and suffering at the cost of their humanity. There's little difference between Mandus' machine and the senseless loss of life he so desperately wishes to prevent. Arguably more interesting than Mandus' journey is the machine itself. The engineer, who guides Mandus through the factory, isn't your average antagonist. One thing the game doesn't really make clear is how much of the story is real, and more importantly, how much of it is magic. For example, the orb that Mandus discovers in Mexico is almost certainly the same kind that Daniel encountered in The Dark Descent, and his vision stemmed from interacting with this mystical artifact. However, the engineer is described as having split from Mandus' soul. He is the embodiment of his anger and spite towards the rest of humanity, but he's not simply evil. In one of the greatest voice performances in anything I've played, Mandus approaches the machine and climbs the steps with the intention of finally stopping it. The machine, having already sent man pigs to the streets of London and almost succeeding in its plan, pleads with Mandus not to shut it down. In the machine's twisted view, humanity's only choice is to be sacrificed either on the steps of an altar in Mexico, beneath the streets of London, or on the front lines of some war. The machine isn't murdering out of spite. It seems to genuinely believe that what it's doing is merciful, just as Mandus believed it was a mercy to murder his own children, rather than see them grow up and die on the front lines. The innocent, the innocent Mandus trod and bled and gassed and starved and beaten and murdered and enslaved. This is your coming century. They will eat the Mandus. They will make pigs of you all. And they will bury their snaps into your ribs. And they will eat your hearts. Objectively, Amnesia A Machine for Pigs is not the greatest game ever made. It's far too easy, it's fairly short, and it doesn't even run particularly well at points, especially on consoles. But I do believe that it's greater than the sum of its parts. I think horror can be used to tell extremely complex stories, in ways that other genres simply can't. And while A Machine for Pigs may be nasty and downright vicious, its story is extremely human. In the end, what made people so angry? Like many things in this industry, I firmly believe it was hype. Amnesia changed the face of horror for years, and a sequel had far too much writing on it. But that leaves me with a thought. Would it be any different if it wasn't called Amnesia? I think so, but in that case, it probably wouldn't exist at all. A Machine for Pigs will probably never shake the image of being a bad sequel, but I truly believe it's one of the greatest horror stories this medium has ever seen, if only it could break from the shackles of its own name. If you made it all the way to the end, thank you so much. This is the first time in a while that I've gotten to make a video going this in depth, and I really loved making it. As always, please comment and tell me what you think. And subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. If you'd like to leave a tip, my coffee link is in the description. And also, if you're someone who uses TikTok, I've started posting mini reviews over there. So if you want to check that out, it's also in the description. Thanks once more, and I'll see you again real soon.